Hello and welcome to the video on normality and linearity. So I'm going to be talking about normality. I want you to remember when we're talking about normality that we're talking about always continuous data. Okay, so data has to be continuous to be checking for the normality assumption. And also we are looking at univariate data. So a single continuous um, variable. Okay, so what is it? What is this thing that is normality? Normality is the idea that the data that you have on a single continuous variable is as close as necessary to the normal bell curve. So you see here this purple normal bell curve, which happens so frequently in human research and measuring most any variable. And if the data that you have is close to a normal curve, you're in really good shape. And you're very happy about that. However, if it's skewed, and you can see here two different kinds of skews. One is negatively skewed there. Um, and for that one, you can see and look here, like there's a tail here on the left side. So you know that something is skewed negative when that side, that left side is has a tail. And then on this side, when the right side has a tail to the curve, that's positively skewed. So that always helps me remember too by looking like oh, a right tail is positive and a left tail is negative. And then that beautiful normal curve that meets the requirements, um, meets the assumptions of statistics is in the middle. So why is skewness a problem when you are doing statistics? Like what is the problem that we're trying to detect and solve? And the problem is that any distant skew data, so things that fall on the far edges of the normality curve, are gonna act like outliers in a data set. They'll over influence the data set compared to the rest of the data and falsely move the mean score or move the regression line or whatever um, further than is really warranted. Um, and all tests, ANOVA tests, T tests, F tests, and many others, the regressions, that sorts of things, all depend on the data having a, what's called a constant variance or following a normal distribution. So we do require that. This is what skewness and kurtosis looks like in SPSS output. So I'm gonna have you look here. You can see right here, it's got skewness. And then if you go over here, you've got three variables. One's called trial one, whatever that is. And it's everyone's skewness score here is a negative 0.815. So it's skewed a little bit negative. Um, this one is 0 0.205 for skewness. And that's pretty good. It's close to zero. Zero would be perfect skewness. And this one is 0.165, which is pretty great. That's pretty close to zero. So you can see your mean scores here and they change from trial one, two, three, but really what we're caring about for normality is looking here at these skewness variables. So in some worlds, negative 0.185 would be a problem. Most of the time in my class, I'm pretty liberal about skewness and will allow it to be from negative one to one. And if it's outside of that range, then you have a problem that you have detected, all right? Occasionally I will change the rules on that, but I'll make it clear in any homework quiz or test that we're doing. So this is what to do to find normality, right? Univariate normality. How do you find out if you have a problem with it and uh, need to detect it? So first of all, just screening all continuous variables that you're going to analyze in your data analysis for normality by looking at the skewness and kurtosis. And particularly the skewness is what's important. That you get the gold star right there showing like that's really probably the best way to detect whether you have a problem with skewness. It also, for the sake of a class, gives us a very clear cutoff line for when skewness is a problem or not. You can also look at graphs and see whether it looks like it's kind of got a tail on it, if it's leaning left or right. Um, and you can also do something called the commoner graph Smirnoff test, which is a one sample non-parametric test, which tests for normality. And if it's significant, that's not good. That means you don't have normal data. Um, I don't like to use that one. I think it's a little too strict, but your textbook does 
teach you how to do that and the data will come up automatically from SPSS output now and then. So just kind of knowing. But if they disagree and your SKUNA says you don't have a problem and Kalmar Smirnoff test says you do have a problem with normality, you generally, in my class anyway, will just go with we don't have a problem because SKUNA says we don't. Um, the larger the sample, the less important skewness and kurtosis becomes. This is the same as outliers. If you have a thousand people in a data set, then a couple of outliers don't move the mean score very much. Um, you're not going to get your, your numbers over influence versus if you only have 50 in a data set. So dissertations at Regent often are smaller. Um, you guys are studying phenomenon um, and you don't have large funding usually to be able to pay. So um, I want to make sure you really do pay attention to this for the sake of your future dissertations. And then we have um, kurtosis here. It's just, this is a, a citation from Waterno, 1976. It's an old citation, um, but it still holds true that kurtosis is probably not a problem if you at least have 100 or 200 people in your data set. So sometimes you can kind of go back to some of these references and be able to say, hey, I'm not going to bother with transforming and fixing my problem because Water News says that I'm fine, right? things like that. But you'll notice even in my class, we don't transform anything for kurtosis. We just note it and just pay attention if you have very high or low um, numbers on your kurtosis. So what do you do next if your data is not normal, right? Um, one thing you can do is just report it and live with it. And while any, you know, statistics class student would love to just report it, live with it and move on. Um, however, that is going to violate assumptions. And now your ANOVA, MANOVA, regression, t-test, whatever you're running may give you um, outcome that is not reliable, right? You may, um, you know, just kind of like not have true outcome of your data and you want the truth from your data you're going to go all this trouble so um, what we're going to learn in this class is called transforming the variable so in my um well in the data we just looked at um there was one trial one that first column of data that had the skewness of negative 0.8 something um you might decide you know what that's not acceptable. We're going to have to transform that. So if it's a moderately positive skewness, let's say, um, on the positive side, then what you can do is take everyone's score that they got on trial one and take the square root of everyone's score. And that will transform the data if you use that number, the square root of the number, instead of the original number. This is fine to do because we're in numbers land and as long as you treat everybody the same, the numbers that are there are, you know, the computer's kind of blind to what the numbers mean. So it's fine to do that. Um, I strongly suggest you pull out your Mertler and Veneta textbook. There is a page in chapter three that has all of the information about transformation and go ahead and mark that because we pretty much have this problem throughout the entire semester and you're going to keep going back to that table to do transformations all semester. So this is the data that you're looking for in your data set um, or in your textbook actually. If you look in your Mertner and Vanetta textbook you will find a, a box somewhere in there. I'm just going to let you go hunting for it because you know, new editions come out at any time and no, page numbers change. So take the time to do that. And you'll find something that looks like this. If there's a moderate positive skewness, then you take the square root of X. So X is your variable that you found to have a skewness problem, right? So if you found trial one had a skewness of 1.05, right? So it's just a little over the cutoff of one, then you're going to tell the computer, I want the square root of trial one. And then you're going to check it and see if the square root of trial one, once you square root it, now the norma the uh, skewness value drops and gets better, right? Closer to zero or close enough, crosses your critical value. And so for my class, typically the critical value is positive one and then on the negative side, negative one. If, however, that doesn't solve it and you do a square root of the variable and it's still above one, then you can erase that what you just did and try the next one, which is a high positive skewness and you take the log 10 of it, right? And if, if that solves it, great, you're good. If that doesn't solve it, erase that variable and take the inverse, which would be one over the variable. And that's the best you can do. If that still doesn't solve it, that's as good as it gets um, for your data. 
Um, so this is all positive skew. If you need the negative skew, then what you're going to have to do is find a constant score because otherwise your your new numbers will fall into the negative range and you don't want negative numbers added to a formula. It throws everything off, right? You remember this from algebra class. So in order to fix that, we what we do is we find a constant. So essentially what you do, and you see there on that bottom um, – right here you find the highest score in the variable so say for instance the highest score that anybody got on the variable is a 10 right and maybe it was scaled from 1 to 10 so the highest score anyone could get is a 10 and that was the highest number you got then your constant would be 10 plus 1 which is 11 and then you use that and plug it into the formula when you need the constant now your constant for that variable is 11 any variable you use, you find the maximum score that anybody got on it, and then you just add one, and that's your constant. We will go over this in class when we are doing SPSS for, um, for data transformation. This is one of the more difficult things to do because you have to plug and chug. But if you can plug and chug, you can do it, and the computer will do it for you. You don't have to do these by hand. So as we finish out the section on normality, you want, I want to make sure that you remember what kind of data are we looking for normality problems for in our analysis, right? Are we looking at univariate or multivariate data? The answer is we're looking for univariate variables, so single variables. We look at each single variable to see if we have a problem with normality each on their own. We don't put them together, right? Um, that would be multivariate, two or three or more together. We're looking at each individual univariate at a time. And then are we looking at categorical data or continuous data? And the answer is continuous. Normality is a bell curve, so you have to be continuous for a bell curve to happen. If you have groups, just like two groups or three groups, you can have unequal n, which is kind of a similar type of problem, right, in the groups where one group has like 100 people and the other group has five people, and that's kind of a big problem um, that you're trying to compare the two groups. But on continuous variables, that's the bell curve that we're checking. So when we're looking at normality, we're always looking at individual univariate data and continuous data. And what you would do is any analysis you're doing, just look at, okay, of my variables that I'm examining, which ones are continuous? And look at the skewness for each of those. This is the recording where we are examining the issue of linearity, which is like normality, but it's applied to two or more variables at once. Linearity is a lot like normality. In fact, I call it normality's cousin, maybe an upgrade, something like that. But it is the idea that statistics assumes there is a straight line relationship between any two variables, whether or not they're independent or dependent variables or covariates or something in a model um, in more advanced statistics. Any two continuous variables um, will have a straight line continuous relationship um, that is linear. So for instance, if you're looking at religiosity and church attendance, you should see something you can plot on a scatter plot like this. This is a scatter plot that is, has very nice linearity. What we have here are two continuous variables. We have one here, don't worry about explanatory, just any variable, and one here, any variable, right? So any continuous, two continuous variables, and you plot them. When one, someone scored like about a one here and they scored about like a 0.7 here, right? And that's that one person. Um, and you go all the way through here and plot all the different people. And then when you look at it, you can draw a line down the middle of this pretty well and get a line, right? It looks like a line. Or if you were to kind of draw a circle around the majority of it, you would get something that looks like a hot dog <laughs> um, or a blimp. What we have a problem with is if you see this and it looks like this, it's going down, right? Now you've got a curve here, right? Where if that data all turned this way um, or in the other way, if the data was like going like this or if the data was going like this, right? Anytime you have a curve of data and if you were to draw a line down the center of the data, it starts to look like a curve or it starts to look like a wave, right? And we're into the trigonometry world. Um, and you, you have something that's quadratic here and you don't have a line. So everything we're doing this semester is assuming 
a line. So if linearity is an assumption that we need to check, how do we actually check it? Well, in my class in particular, what you're really going to do in my class is the bivariate scatter plot, like what we just looked at on the last slide. Um, so you're going to tell the computer to plot them and you're going to look at it and you're going to say, hmm, either it looks like a big blob, which is fine if the data is a big blob and it doesn't even look, looks like a, a giant fat hot dog um, or a giant fat blimp, that's fine. Um, what you don't want to see are rainbows or smiles of data, right, on your scatter plot and when you're examining it or um, quadratic equation, you know, way, hills of data. Um, you can do something called residual plots. We'll, we'll cover this a little bit when we cover regression, but not, not very much. Um, you can look at your correlations as well, and you should see something that moves into the moderate range. If you have extremely low correlations, you might really want to look at those scatter plots and see if you have a, a big blob of data and it's a low correlation, that's fine. But if you have a low correlation and it looks like, you know, you're getting your, your rainbow of data and that's why you're getting a low correlation, then you've got a problem. Um, now, one of the problems is that in the real world, some relationships actually are curvilinear. So for instance, if you have symptoms and you start to take a medication, you'll get a little better with a little bit of medication, right? And then a little more medication, you get a little more better and it keeps going up like this. And then there comes a point, if you give somebody like 10 times the amount of penicillin that they're supposed to get, they'll actually start to get sick, right? And their symptoms will get worse. Um, and that's the actual true, real data, curvilinear data on drug dosage, right? It's linear to a point, and then all of a sudden now, it's not linear anymore, it's curvilinear. If the true relationship is a curve and not linear, you can try to transform it Right? By transforming it, you might get something that's a curve to be a little bit more linear and it might get close enough to be able to analyze it. You can also, in a study like this, just do like, okay, we're going to cut it off here, right? Like it stops being linear here. Like in drug dosage, that would be a good reason, like if it stops working. But if you're doing original research, you might come to find out like, no, it's not toxic for people. It's just not working anymore. Um, and then you want that information, right? You can also do some more advanced statistics that will give you you, you know, uh, that don't assume the linear model. They um, allow for curvilinear or chaos theory applied to statistics or really fancy things like that that we do not cover in um, our program. Okay, so if you are doing linearity and you need to check it, how do you do it? First, run a scatter plot and eyeball it. Make sure you don't have rainbows or smiles or hills in your data. Um, you also can run a correlation. And if you have a really, really low number, then you might especially want to look at that scatter plot. And then when you do regression, which we'll cover in uh, later this semester, actually, then you look at residual plots. This is what normality would look like for three or more variables. And you start to see here how we move out of something that we can look at like a scatter plot, and we move into the mathematical. Um, and there are more advanced statistics that can check for normality with three or more variables together. We will not be doing that in this course. You'll be probably glad to know. Um, what we do when there's three, say you have a MANOVA and you have three continuous variables as your dependent variables, and you need to check that you have linearity between those three continuous variables, or anytime you have three or more continuous variables, what we'll do in this class is we'll check them by, by variate, right? So we'll do variable one with two and make sure that looks like a blimp or a hot dog and then check one versus three and make sure that one looks good and then two versus three and make sure that one looks good so that all your continuous variables that you're analyzing in your data, that they all have linear relationships with each other. And once you have that, you're pretty good. Linearity is also not something that is so strict that it becomes a big problem versus normality. If that's violated, that is such a problem that you do need to solve it. Um, before you go forward. Linearity, you just kind of like report it unless it's severe and then you try transformations um, and uh, then you cry basically if it still doesn't solve it. <laughs> okay, so just check in to make sure that you understand the important basic idea behind linearity. What kind of data are we looking at when we're checking for linearity? All right, is it categorical or continuous? 
it is continuous, right? It's all, and it's how many variables? For my class, we're checking two, right? Two at a time, any two variable, continuous variables that are a part of a data analysis, you wanna check for linearity to make sure it's meeting the assumption of the linear model that all of this, the statistics that we do in this class are built on. Um, you can do three or more, but we do them at a bivariate level, so, okay? So it's continuous variables on a bivariate level. Very good.